So well, welcome everyone to the second in our uh, series of PacBio Bioinformatics uh, workshops. Uh, I'm James Miller. I'm going to MC the event uh, today and be monitoring the chat for any questions. Now, last week we had a webinar on HiFi whole genome sequencing variance analysis um, on the 6th of uh, August. And this week we, uh, our webinar is on Connect's full length RNA sequencing. Um, it will go for about uh, two hours and we will be recording this session. And after the event, we'll send out a link to everyone uh, of the recording and, uh, and also ask for some feedback. Uh, we'll also send out a link of the recording of last week's uh, webinar as well, if you're interested in the variance analysis online workshop and you, and you happen to miss it. So this week we have uh, our presenter today is Ting Ting Zhu. Uh, she's our field applications bioinformatics support, um, supporting um, PacBio from PacBio. Um, and Ting Ting today is going to talk about the Connects full length RNA sequencing. She's going to talk about the Connects methodology overview. Uh, she'll do a, a data analysis deep dive, uh, and then she'll go into talking about the Smart Link uh, workflow guide. Uh, and then a use case of gene fusion identification. Uh, we also have um, Paul Gooding, our local support from Millennium Science on, and Millennium Science uh, assisting us to, to host this webinar. So a, a call out to our channel partner, uh, Millennium Science. Uh, so with that, uh, oh, also, if you have any, if you have any questions, uh, we will be monitoring the chat. So please put your questions in the chat. And we'll have a, a couple of, probably a couple of natural stopping points where we can, we'll put those questions to Ting Ting. So yeah, just keep feeding your questions into the chat and uh, we'll, we'll address them uh, as we go or at a stopping point for Ting Ting. Okay, with that, I will hand over to Ting Ting to uh, start the presentation. So thank you for the introduction, James. I think I'm going to share my screen on the... So, so I guess you can hear me and you can all see my screen right now, right? Yeah, looks good. Yeah. Okay. So hello everyone, I'm Ting Ting. I'm a field bioinformatics support scientist at PacBio. So for today's webinar, I'm going to talk about our bioinformatics resources for Kinex foldings and single cell RNA analysis. And for the duration of the presentation, I'm going to have my camera off uh, to focus on the, to focus on the slides. So, okay. So here's today's agenda. And first, I will briefly introduce the Kinex methodology for the bulk and the single cell RNA sequencing. And then we will dive deep into the data analysis pipeline for both workflows, including specific tools and command line instructions. And next, I will show you a step-by-step -step guide to utilizing our software SmartLink for these two workflows, covering both graphic user interface GUI and command line-based approaches, as well as some um, key results interpretation. And uh, lastly, I will talk about the process of uncovering gene fusions using Kinex isosic data and uh, our tool, PP Fusion. So before we get started, I want to give a quick overview of our HiFi sequencing technology. So first and foremost, we use a polymerase as a sequen sequencing engine, and we put circularized adapters on the end of our, of our share, shared DNA. And in this way, it allows our polymerase to make multiple passes around a single molecule. And since our errors are random, instead of systematic, then we can align the multiple passes together. And what that leave us, leave us with is very high consensus accuracy because we can solve correct the individual reads with the consensus of multiple passes. So not only are we left with very high accuracy reads, but those reads also are long reads. And typically these reads are tons of kilobases in length, and they also get single molecule resolution and this is really important because that allows you to phase a single molecule 
And this becomes important when you're looking at the following RNA sequencing and other types of applications. And now let's start with a question. So why do we need long reads for RNA sequencing? So this is because RNA molecules tend to be long. The average molecule size is on the order of two kilobases. And if you can't read through the various splice junctions in these isoforms, you don't know what isoforms the genes are expressing. Multiple isoforms can create multiple proteins and these different proteins have different functions. So here I'm showing an example of the BCLX gene where we have two isoforms. One isoform promotes cell death and suppresses cancer. The other inhibits cell death and promotes cancer. So if you were unable to identify the isoform that was being expressed, you would not know whether this BCLX gene was promoting or suppressing cancer. And more than that, when you are sequencing with the short read technologies, short reads tend to give reads on the order of a few hundred base pairs, and those are insufficient to read through RNA molecules that are on the order of 2,000 upwards to 10,000 and more bases in length. And because of that, when you're done sequencing with the short read technology, you're left with a puzzle that doesn't have a unique answer because you have multiple reads and none of them are giving you a single full length isoform. So you take all of the reads and you can put them together in many different ways. However, contrast to that, long read sequencing is able to sequence from the three prime region to the five prime region all in one read, and you get all of the various splice junctions from all of the isoforms in individual reads without having to do any assembly of the data. So here, when you hear isoSeq, we're talking about PacBio's full-length RNA sequencing methodology. The reason we call it isoSeq is because you get a full view of isoform sequencing, hence the name isoSeq. And here you see a study from one of our customers where she was looking at different isoforms for fetal human osteoblast mainly focusing on bone mineral differentiation. In this study, she found four isoforms with isoSeq data on this gene. And she showed that if you express the two isoforms on top, you increase bone density. Whereas if you express these two isoforms at the bottom, you decrease bone density. So what she concluded was that Different isoforms of this gene have distinct functions with respect to osteoblast activity and are likely regulators of bone mineral density. And this publication is focusing on gastric cancer. Novel isoforms were shown to be useful biomarkers that predicted the prognosis of cancer patients. In this case, a novel promoter for the ARID1A gene which results in a new promoter and therefore a shortening of the transcript was shown to be linked to patient survival. In other words, patients with the novel promoter had a different progression-free survival than those whose cancer expressed the known promoter. So this is one of several studies that showed clearly that isoform can be used as effective cancer biomarkers. And another great publication on ENCODE4 came out recently. And the reason that this one is very exciting is because it shows that it's not just those structural variants that allow species to drive uniqueness from one another, but that isoforms are also huge drivers. So this study identified 200,000 200, full length transcripts with 40% containing novel junction chains and importantly, they found substantial splicing diversity even in orthologous genes between the human and mouse models. And these findings suggest that isoform play a major role in the unique morphologies observed between human and the mice. And uh, compared to other long read sequencing technologies, we do have advantages. And here shows a study from long read RNA-seq Genome Annotation Assessment Project, or LG-GASP for short. 
So this is a benchmarking study showing that PECBI iso methods detects longer and more accurate ISO forms than the ONT. And actually, ONT, despite having 10 times more data at the time of this benchmarking, iso actually got more genes. And this indicates that read quality and length are important factors for transcript identification. So now when we are talking about RNA sequencing, there are a couple of different ways you can think about. You have bulk RNA sequencing, and then you have single cell RNA sequencing. So bulk RNA sequencing, we could think of like drinking a fruit smoothie that there's kiwi, there's strawberry, and there's banana in there. And you can kind of taste all of the different flavors, but all of those different flavors are all muddled together in one shake. And on the other side, single cell sequencing is more like eating a fruit salad. You can see the kiwi, you can see the strawberry, and each of those have been partitioned away from the others. So that whenever you want to look at the data from one cell type, you can see that individual cell. All of the information from that cell type is assembled together and clustered so that you're only getting the information from cell type A or only the information from cell type B without any compounding from the other cells. And sometimes people want to study single cells because many diseases are heterogeneous at the cell level. For example, when you say there's a cancer, it doesn't mean every cell in that cancerous tissue is the same. So this slide just briefly explains what the differences of using PECBAL long reads for single cell sequencing. So when you use short reads for single cell, you're only capturing the gene level information due to the limitation of the read length. And this is because the single cell tag information, such as cell barcodes and UMIs are only at the ends of the molecule. And therefore, when you have short reads that cannot sequence the entire molecule in one go, you can only capture the gene ends. And in contrast, with PECBAL single cell isoseq, you can get full length isoforms with high accuracy, and you can capture the UMI and the barcode information as well. And this slide outlines a study on ovarian cancer using single cell isoseq. So researchers analyzed individual cells to uncover isoform variations and genomic alterations. Compared to short read single cell RNA-seq, PECBAL's single cell isoseq offers significant advantages, including the ability to identify novel isoforms, detect both known and previously unknown gene fusions, and precisely pinpoint cancer-related mutations expressed at the single cell level. Now let's get into the Kinex RNA sequencing side. So our isoseq has always started at the gene level and give you full-length isoforms. So you can now look at different isoforms related to a single gene. Those isoforms are only a couple of thousand kilobases in length. As we know, hi-fi reads can be in the 15 to 20 kilobases range. So if we are only sequencing a single molecule, there's a lot of wasted real estate on that cell. So what Kinex methodology does is it takes each one of these isoforms and then it allows us to concatenate multiple isoforms together using a concatenation methodology that's described in the paper you see on the right here. And that will form a single hi-fi read and concatenating multiple molecules together allows us to increase the throughput of those isoforms with this single methodology. And when we pair that with the RAVIO system, we expect about 14 million full length concatenate reads per RAVIO cell. We also think that this is going to increase our recommendations for what we consider a gold standard annotation. So you can see here on the graph at the bottom that we start seeing saturation at about 10 million reads. So at 10 million reads, um, we're hitting about 80% of known isoforms for the different samples that are listed here. And we also wanted to know to show that we are not impacting transcript sizes. 
so that we're still able to capture those longer transcripts as well. So if you take a look at the graph up on the right top here, you can see that for all organisms listed, we still have that right tail for those longer transcripts that we know, we know exist within an organism's biology. So here I will explain a bit on how the Kinex arrays work. So the first step of the array process is cDNA generation. So we take our RNA molecules, we create cDNA, and when we are creating the cDNA, we add a handle along with the five prime cDNA primers that allows us to do the second step of the process. So the second step is Kinex PCR, where we add a very specific concatenation adapter to each end of each of our molecules. By adding these adapters, we're able to tile the individual reads into one much longer read. And in the third step, the array formation step, we take all of those individual cDNA molecules and we ligate them together stepwise all the way down. And we create a very long molecule for sequencing from relatively short molecules. So in this example of a bulk isoseq sequencing, uh, we're going to take molecules about, of about 2,000 base pair in length, and we take eight of those and array them out. And after the kinase concatenation, we have a long molecule with a size of about 18 kilobases that are actually going on to sequencing. So for the Kinox applications, we do have an end-to-end -end solution going all the way from the cDNA generation through the data analysis workflow within our SmartLink software. So the analysis workflow will break the segmented reads out of the Kinox arrays, and it does the primary extraction step, which removes all of the biologically irrelevant information and it leaves you with just uh, the biologically important bits of data in both the bulk isoseq and the single cell isoseq workflows. And we then go on and then map that back to a reference, and then the transcripts are classified for whether this is a known or a novel isoform. And you get all of the various output files in industry standard formats and then finally, you're able to use them as inputs into the tertiary analysis tools. For example, PP Fusion for fusion gene detection or Sura Kana for cell type clustering. Now let's step deep into the Kinex following RNA workflow or the Kinex, Kinex bulk isoseq workflow. So what you see here is the structure of a Kinex following RNA library template. The outermost are the Kinex barcoded adapter at both ends. There, there are a total of four different barcodes that can be used for the adapter, shown in blue. And then there's another layer of cDNA barcodes on each concatenated amplicon, which is the pink BC. And we have a total of 12 barcoded cDNA primers so you can do up to 48 unique cDNAs per ravel cell if using in combination with the four barcoded Kinex adapters. And here are some isoseq terms you should be familiar with. So the first is segmented reads or S reads. So these are hi-fi reads that have been segmented based on the presence of a segmentation adapter. And then full-length reads or FL reads. These are S reads with five prime and three prime cDNA primers removed. And then full-length non-concatenate reads or FLNC reads. So these are FL reads with poly A tail and concatenate removed. And when we perform a clustering based on FLNC reads, we will get consensus isoforms. Those isoforms that are supported by at least two FLN series and have accuracy greater than or equal to 99%, we call them high quality isoforms or HQ isoforms. And those isoforms um, have a accuracy less than 99% are called low quality isoforms or LQ isoforms. 
So here is an overview of the entire Connect Volane Sarni workflow. So in the Smart Link encapsulation, this is going to be two separate workflows, being read segmentation and ISO SIG. So to kick this off, we go from hi fi reads to segmented reads using the tool called SCARA. We demultiplex those transcripts into different samples using Lima. And then further refinement and clustering steps are performed with the ISOSIC tool. So now, if you do not have the reference genome of your sample, you can stop here. At this point, the results you obtained are the primary transcriptome with consensus high quality isoforms. And if you have the reference genome for your sample, you can go on analyze your data until the collapse stop. And then you will get a non-redundant transcriptome with unique isoforms. And finally, if you have the annotation file available, you can go all the way till the end of this workflow to obtain the classified isoforms. So in the next few slides, I'm going to go over each of the tools and how to run them. So the first tool after you have your hi-fi reads ready is SCARA. And what SCARA does is it will deconcatenate your reads into its, con into its constituent CDN molecules. So here we have a concatenated molecule with concatenation adapters A through E and four constituent cDNA molecules in between. And SCARA will trim all these adapters and only retain the cDNA molecules. So this will result in four cDNA molecules. And the command for this is pretty simple. It's just a SCARA split. And the number of threads that you want to use, your hi fi reads, your segmentation adapters, and then your output segmented reads. And following this, um, this is what your molecule topology looks like, where we have the 5' prime cDNA primer, your transcript poly A, and the 3' prime cDNA primer. And using Lima, we are able to trim the cDNA primers at both ends. So we're just left with the cDNA molecule. For this, it want to use the isosig preset on Lima. So this preset will also help you to orientate your cDNA molecules from 5' prime to 3' prime, and also to remove any unwanted primer combinations. And after this, we go to isosig refine. It will check for a poly A signal in your sequences, and it will also check for artificial concatenators. So if there's a PCR chimera, it should be able to get rid of those if there is a cDNA primer in the middle. So the parameter that we use to run this is require poly A. And following isosig refine, we will use isosig cluster tool for clustering. This will generate consensus sequence for high quality isoforms. Typically, two FLNC reads are considered the same isoform if there is less than 100 base pair difference at the 5' prime end, less than 30 base pair difference at the 3' prime end, and less than 10 base pair in the internal gaps, no matter how many gaps there are. So the command is simple. Just use isoc cluster tool, your input refined BAM, and your output clustered BAM. And if you are dealing with multiple BAMs together, you will need to use file of file names, the FLFN, instead of your input BAM files. So again, if you do not have the reference genome for your sample, you can stop here. So what you obtain is the high quality or HQ isoforms. So if you do have your um, reference genome ready, you can align the high quality isoforms to the reference genome, and this will produce a set of spliced alignments. So here for the alignment, we use PBMM2, which is PecBios wrapper around Minimap2. We use the isoseq preset here, and we would also like to sort the output. And once we have our spliced alignments, we can use isoseq clubs to produce unique isoforms based on their transcript features. 
So this will look at your transcription start and end sites, as well as your splice junctions and collapse, collapse them into unique ISO form. And it will produce a collapsed GFF file, which can then be sorted using our next tool, Pigeon, to create a sorted GFF file. Please note, ISO C collapse by default will collapse ISO forms containing five prime degradation. So it is recommended to turn off this by using the do not collapse extra five axioms argument for the bulk ISO seek. And the following collapse, we can use Pigeon, which is our SCOM-T3 replacement to classify ISO forms into their own structural categories based on a reference transcriptome. So for those of you familiar with transcriptomics, you're pro probably also familiar with this classification system, which will tell you whether your ISO forms match all of your splice size to result in a full splice match, FSM, or maybe you're missing terminal axons, which are incomplete splice matches, ISM, or if you have novel isoforms, this, this classification step requires a, a spattering of different reference files. So the ones that we are particularly interested in are the abundance of each molecule, a list of poly A motifs, as well as bad file of KGP positions to determine how reliable our five prime and three prime ends are. And this will produce a tab delimited classification file in which your unique isoforms are labeled with their structural categories, either FSM, ISM, NIC, or NNC. So if you are interested in discovering novel isoforms, you may want to look at the NIC and NNC categories. And the following classification, we can also filter out isoforms that are likely to be artifacts. So isoforms that align to intronic regions of the genome, reads that span both intronic and axonic regions, and things that are a product of premature RT switching or interpriming will get filtered out. And this will give you a nice clean set of isoforms. And you may also use the pigeon report tool to output a text file containing the read count and number of unique genes found in a, in a subsampled number of reads. And this will give you some idea of whether you have generated enough reads for your transcriptome. And then lastly, Pigeon Prepare can help you to validate the reference files for use with the Pigeon tools, because Pigeon only accepts gen code annotation GTF5 formats. Other GTF formats will need to be modified in order to work with Pigeon. And we have human and mouse reference and annotation files ready for use within SmartLink. But if you are working with other species, you will need to modify your files first. And that's when you want to use Pigeon Prepare to check the format of your modified files. So here lists common library artifacts. So you can see the topmost molecule is a normal library with five prime as the beginning and the three prime primer at the end. And then we have RT artifacts with three prime primer at both ends, and then TSO artifacts with five prime primer at both ends, and then artificial concatenators containing primers located within the transcript. And lastly, PCR chimeras, which is similar to artificial concatenators but lack internal primer sequences. So our isoSeq analysis workflow can detect and remove all types of artifacts except for the PCR chimeras. The PCR chimeras are generated during the PCR process, and it is really hard to distinguish such artifacts from real gene fusion. So if you see a structure and the results, you will need to use other methods to verify them. So next, we will look at the Kinex single cell RNA workflow. 
So basically, the array formation on the Kinex single cell side um, is similar to that of Kinex bulk ISO6. Both are from cDNA synthesis to array formation. So the only differences are, first, the cDNA primers to generate single cell cDNA molecules are not barcoded. And second, the concatenated cDNA segments are 16 versus 8 in Kinex bulk ISO6 workflow. So for Ravio smart cell, you can pull four samples at the most, taking advantages of the four barcoded Kinex adapters. And here on top, you can see a concatenated single cell RNA library structure, and each amplicon within this library can be either from 10x3 prime kit, as shown on the left, or the 10x5 prime kit shown on the right. So for the UMI and the barcode design, we use different letters to represent different components. For example, we use T for transcript, U for UMI, B for cell barcode, and X for TSO. And when we write the design, we should always follow the string with the polyatel. So in the 10x3 prime kit, if we follow the string with poly A, it should be this one. So we first see your transcript and we write a T here. And then we see 12 BP UMI, so 12 U. And then we see 16 BP cell barcode, then 16 B. And likewise, and the 10x5 prime kit, we follow the strain, the poly A strain. So we first see 16 um, BP cell barcode, so 16 B, then 10 BP UMI, 10 U, and then 10 BP TSO, 10 NEX, and then lastly, your transcript. Um, so this design is required in our Kinex single cell ISO6 data analysis workflow, but we'll see later. So the Kinex single cell ISO6 workflow goes from, uh, it's very similar, goes from high fi reads to segmented reads, and ultimately into ISO for matrix for single cell tertiary analysis. So similar to the Kinex bulk ISO6 workflow, we go from high fi reads to segmented reads using SCARA. And after this, we do primer, UMI, and the barcode extraction using Lima, TAC, and the Refine. And then we do barcode correction and UMI deduplication using correct group dedupe, which will ultimately give us our unique molecules. And we then take all of our unique molecules and map them to our reference genome. And afterwards, we use collapse in order to get rid of any redundant isoforms for this sample. So the left isoforms are then structurally classified by pigeon. And this will also make tertiary software compatible gene and isoform matrix for use with Sura, ScanPy, or Kana. And this will enable you to do all of your cell type clustering. So here, the first tool in this pipeline is DOS, SCARA. So similar to what it does in the bulk ISO6 workflow, it, de, um, it deconcatenates reason to constituent cDNA molecules. So the command for this is still SCARA split. The only difference is the segmentation adapters. So in bulk ISO6, we use MOS8, but here we use MOS16, depending on how many amplicons are concatenated into one library template. And next up, we use Lima, which will remove your primer sequences. So as you can see in the figure to the right, this is what your molecule topology looks like. And we, where we have the 10 next TSO, your transcript, poly A, UMI, so barcode, and a 10 next three prime primer. And using Lima, we're able to remove the five prime TSO as well as the three prime 10 next primer. And what you are left with is your transcript which contains your poly A, your UMI, and your cell barcode. And all this requires is the option for iso and the 10x primers along with your segmented BAM file. And after this, what we want to do is extract the UMI and cell barcode from each of these transcripts. And when we do this, it will get excised from the sequence in the BAM entry and afterwards, it will be stored into BAM tags B 
been XM for the UMI and XC for the cell barcode. And when you run this command, command and command line, you need to specify a design for your transcript. So remember the design we just introduced. Here we show the design for the 10x3 prime kit. So it is written in T12U16B. And with this design, isosync tag just takes in the lima output and outputs your tagged band file. And if you were to use 10x5 prime kit or other kits, you should have to change the transcript design. And then isosync refine to trim poly A tail and remove concatenators. And this uses the option require poly A and searches for concatenators using your 10x cDNA primers. So similar to what it does in the bulk isosync workflow. And the following isosync refine will be used isosync correct for a barcode correction. And it will take a list of canonical 10x barcodes, your cDNA sequence, and your tagged barcodes. And it will correct this cell barcode with a mismatch to a canonical barcode that's in your list. And after that, uh, it will no longer have that mismatch. And then after this, we also use some tools to sort the output band file. And we are sorting by the corrected barcode tag. And following this, we do group dedu, which will essentially take your molecules and look at their UMIs. And if they match, it will collapse those into molecules, into one molecule. So once we have deduplicated the molecules, we will align them to the reference genome using PBMM to align with the isosync per set. And we would also like to sort the output. And then we can look at redundant isoforms within our data set and then collapse them using isosync collapse into unique isoforms. And after this, we will need to sort the GFF output for use in pigeon. So the following steps regarding pigeon are the same as those in the bulk isosync workflow. So I will not go into details, just so as you know, pigeon classify to classify your isoforms into their own structural categories and pigeon filter to remove genetic introns, genetic genomic isoforms and other artifacts. And the following filtering, we can um, then run make sura to produce an isoform matrix for tertiary analysis. So this will take your filtered isoforms, produce your barcodes, genes, and matrix files, as you would you see with 10x genomic cell ranger software. And this will be able to produce cell type clusters in tertiary analysis suite, such as Kana, Sura, and Scampi. And last also, pigeon report to give you some hints of the gene saturation in this sample, pigeon prepare, and pigeon prepare to validate and the format reference files for use with pigeon tools. So next, I will walk you through how to um, start these two analysis workflows in our software SmartLink. And before that, I think it would be necessary to briefly introduce SmartLink in case some of you are not familiar with it. So SmartLink is PacBio's official software package that guides users through the end-to-end -end workflow from sample setup to data analysis results. And SmartLink software supports both graphical and command line user interfaces for data visualization and mining. So we would say that it is designed for each user in your lab, even if you are a bench scientist without any command line experience. So this is the framework of the whole PacBio sequencing system. So here is your instrument with instrument control computer. And then this instrument communicates with your SmartLink server here. And you can access your SmartLink server through your browser computer, and it will enable you to see your sequence data, which is stored in the storage server. And you can also use the SmartLink server to submit secondary analysis jobs to the compute uh, nodes. 
So to install SmartLink, it requires a server with at least 60, 16 CPU cores, 64 GRAM, and 1T SSD storage. So for larger computational jobs, additional HPC nodes are needed. Specific HPC node requirements vary based on applications and sequencing throughput. So the size of the HiFi restore BAM file containing about 90 giga bases of HiFi data is about 55 gigabytes in size. And this size will increase to 400 gigabytes if the HiFi BAM contains kinetics information. And for the Ravel system, subreads are no longer accessible. And SmartLink offers flexible installation options. Users can choose between a full installation with all components or a streamlined setup with core tools. So the full version includes a graphical user interface, command line tools, as well as reference and barcode sets. But users requiring only core functionalities, a smart tools only installation is available. So shown here are the key modules that are included within, within SmartLink. And specific, specifically, in the Smart Analysis module, we have implemented several secondary analysis applications, such as the novel genome assembly, variant calling, as well as the two Kinex ISOSIG workflows I'm going to walk you through. And SmartLink is available for free on our website, packb.com. And in the download page, other than the software download link, we have also provided detailed documentation regarding how to install and how to use smart software, smart link software. So here lists all the workflows included in the smart analysis module, like genome assembly, isoseq analysis, structural variant quality, etc. And all these workflows accept only high fi reads as input. So the two workflows we just talked about is resegmentation and isoseq analysis for bulk isoseq, and the resegmentation and single cell isoseq analysis for Kinex single cell isoseq. So next, I will walk you through these two workflows in SmartLink GUI. So first, let's look at the Kinex bulk isoseq workflow. So if you would like to start an analysis job in SmartLink, you just go to the Smart Analysis module, go to its home page, and then you can click Create New Job here. And then you give a name of this job. And then under the workflow type, you just specify analysis. And then in the data sets, you choose the data set you'd like to uh, perform your analysis. And then you can hit Next here. And, and next, under the uh, analysis application, you just choose resegmentation and ISO SIG. And then following this, you will need to specify associated inputs for this analysis workflow. So to properly deconcatenate the HiFi reads, the segmentation adapter set would be mass seq adapter V3, mass 8. The DNA primer set has been preloaded to contain the 12 barcoded cDNA primers. And the reference set is preloaded to HG38 with gen code V39 annotations. And the other preloaded reference that comes with annotation and smart link is the mouse genome and annotation. And here there were two options you can choose for clustering of barcoded samples either cluster reads separately or pull reads and cluster together. So if you select by default pull reads and cluster together, it means after identifying the FLNC reads, all of the reads will be pulled together for isoform clustering, mapping, collapse, and classification. And you are getting one final isoform classification file for all samples. And if you choose to cluster reads separately, all of the subsequent processes would be done separately and be output in separate files. And in this scenario, 
The isoform ID will not be the same across different samples if you choose cluster read separately. So here on the right, you can see also advanced parameters for you to adjust, but we actually don't recommend changing these default settings unless it is necessary. Then you can uh, start a workflow. So for a typical Ravio smart cell producing 40 million S reads, the analysis time is typically 15 to 20 hours on a standard compute node with 64 cores. And after the analysis is finished, you can see various statistics and matrix under the analysis job. So here in read segmentation, it will tell you how many hi-fi reads and how many segmented reads you get out of this run, as well as the percentage of the reads that have full arrays. So here, because we concatenated eight amplicons into one hi-fi read, so the full array reads means these many hi-fi reads contain all eight amplicons. So the percentage of reads with full arrays is ideally greater than 80%. And you can also see the mean array size, which is ideally greater than seven. And in resegmentation statistics, you can see QC plot, like this concatenation factor histogram. So where it will show you the percentage in each bin. Again, uh, the plot should ideally show more than 80% of reads with array lengths in this eight segment bin. And you can also see histogram distribution of read number by read length for both hi-fi reads and segmented reads. So for the hi-fi reads, the distribution mode should be concordant with the expected Kinex bulk isoseq library size, library insert size. So uh, it was it will be ideally with the majority of hi-fi reads containing eight segment arrays as here shows in magenta. And then and in read statistics, it generally tells you the cons from um, S reads to FL reads to FLNC reads. So if you are using different barcoded cDNA primers for pulling different samples, you can also see the statist statistics on each primer. So because this data set used only one primer. So you can see these numbers are basically the same, but if you are using different primers, uh, it will be different. And you can also see the length distributions of the FLNC reads. And after clustering, you can see how many high quality isoforms you obtained from your sample, as well as the length distribution. And now, um, Let's take a look at the two types of different outputs from different clustering methods. So first are the pull the run results. So in this example, we have three different samples, but if you choose pull reads and the cluster together in the transcript classification, uh, it shows the isoform classification jointly for the entire data set. That means uh, the three uh, data sets are combined and they have a overall classification. And you will also notice all samples, and that means pigeon runs on a pulled result. And if you choose cluster reads separately, when we get to the classification results, you will notice that each sample actually has its own table, and that's because they've been processed separately to generate these tables. So here you can see biosample one, two, three. So the key output files are listed in file downloads. The most important file is this text file called unique map the transcripts filtered classification. So this file contains unique map the transcript classifications against the annotations, and it is up to filtering results. And there are two other files. So this filtered GFF and this filtered junctions. So these are um, useful for visualizing isoform structures in IGV or UCSC genome browser and enable understanding of why an isoform is novel or known. So if we open up the classification filter result, 
Apparently, this is a joint pigeon classification as indicated by all sample um, in the file name. So in this file, here are the PBIDs, the associated genes and the transcripts. And then in this area, you can see that for each isoform, it shows the supporting full length read counts in terms of row counts normalized by that sample and also in log 10 for each of the samples. So you will get one final classification file and the per sample counts in this file. So you can see these counts for all three samples and isoform IDs are shared among them. So this would allow for direct comparisons across samples. So in, con in contrast, if you run cluster read separately, you're going to get individual files for each sample containing only per sample read counts without comparable isoform IDs. So for the tertiary analysis, we have come up with this application node that summarizes bioinformatics tools for different analysis purposes, either fusion discovery, variant calling, differential transcript analysis, or others. So you can use the link below to download this application node and check out the details. So now let's look at how to start the Kinect single cell RNA workflow in SmartLink, as well as the interpretation of its results. So it is very similar to start the bulk isosync workflow in SmartLink. So you first go to Smart Analysis homepage and uh, click Create New Job. And then you give this analysis job a name and specify what flow type is analysis and then select the data set you would like to analyze. And then in the drop down menu, you select the read segmentation and the single cell isoseq complication. And there are, you can see four associated inputs you will need to specify. So the segmentation adapter set is MOS 16. The primer set is 10x single cell 5 prime or 3 prime cDNA primers, depending on the kit type you specify. So the kit type not only determines which set of 10x primers and cell barcode uh, sequences to use, but also affect the cell barcode in the UMN design setting. So it is very important to specify the correct kit used for library construction. And again, the reference set is either a human or a mouse. And in the advanced parameter, the only thing you may want to change is the cell barcode finding method. So this is used to estimate cell numbers and the default method is knee. In some cases, if the estimated cell number is far below the input cell number, it can change this method to percentile, which uses a more relaxed model. So after the Kinect single cell workflow is finished, you will see various statistics, and the most of them are similar to those with Kinect bulk isoseq workflow. Like in read segmentation, you can see how many half reads and how many segmented reads generated for this sample, as well as the percentage of the reads that have four arrays. And also um, it's concatenation factor histogram, where it will show you the percentage in each bin. So still the percentage of four array reads is ideally greater than 80%. We will also provide read statistics this was just the number of reads that you get at each step in your processing from S reads to FLNC reads. And it will also tell you how many reads have valid barcodes, how many reads after getting corrected, and how many reads you have after the duplication of your UMIs. And in addition, we will also tell you some statistics about how many cells that we think are in your sample as well as the percentage of reads that are inside what we consider to be real cells. So the mean reads per cell, the medium UMIs per cell. So here, please note that there's no correct number of cells. So this matrix depends on what was specified in the 10x chromium single cell workflow as the intended target cell recovery. 
So you can also see transcript summaries where we will tell you exactly the structural categories and the breakdown of each of these for all of your transcripts. So you can see all these structural categories, both before and after filter. And typically it is the files after filter that you want to use for downstream analysis. And in the file downloads, the gzipped file, single cell isoform, and gene matrix is the key output file. So it contains the gene matrix file that are compatible to a tertiary analysis tool. For example, you can use those gene matrix files as input for the cell type clustering tools like Kana, Sura, or ScanPy. So for example, this is a TISNI map I generated using Kana. I have more than 10,000 cells in the sample, and they were clustered into 12 clusters based on the gene matrix files generated by our single cell workflow. And in each cluster, you can see the marker genes as well. So other than using the SmartLink GUI to perform data analysis, you can also run analysis on the command line um, interface using PB Cromwell. So the PB Cromwell tool is a pack bio wrapper for the Cromwell workflow engine used to power smart analysis workflows based on WDL. While PB Cromwell is designed for running pack bios workflows, it can handle any valid WDL source. So you can simply start a smart analysis workflow using the PB Cromwell tool. And you can even design your own workflow by modifying WDL files. Um, you can use PB Cromwell show workflows to list the current available workflows in SmartLink. So here shows all workflows in the latest SmartLink version 13.1. So this is the workflow ID and then followed by a general description of the workflow. And you can see the IDs of the two Kinex ISOSIC workflows here. So when you specify a workflow, only the suffix is needed. Um, so let's say if you want to start the resegmentation and isoseq workflow, you just need to type in PB segment reads and isoseq and nothing more. So you can use show workflow details with workflow ID to view the required entry points for starting a specific workflow. For example, this command is used to show input requirement as well as parameters of the resegmentation and isoseq workflow. So you can see here, this workflow requires four inputs, being your hi-fi reads, your concatenation adapters, your barcode is cDNA primers, and your reference sequence. So the first three inputs are required while the reference sequence is optional. Remember that the bulk isoseq workflow is able to work without serving a reference sequence. And in that case, it will just output your high quality isoforms. And finally, you can launch this workflow by using PB well run with the workflow ID and specify the required um, entry points by dash E. And likewise, the resegmentation and the single cell isoseq workflow also requires four input files. So your high fi reads, concatenation adapters, the 10x cDNA primers, and the reference sequences. And other than that, you will also need to specify the cell barcode set and the key type, either three prime or five prime. And here the default cell barcode finding method is me. And if you need to change it to a percentile, you can modify the value here. And lastly, this slide displays the output directories for both workflows. So the key output directories are circled and their names indicate the tool used to generate corresponding results. And you can find the output files within their respective directories. So here lists the main output files for each step in the Kinex bulk isoseq workflow, as well as the associated output directory. So from isoseq refine to cluster 
to mapping to collapse to pigeon. So the key output you would like to check is from the pigeon folder step within, uh, within cool pigeon. So the final isoform classification file here um, is highlighted in red. So in the last session, um, I will introduce a useful tool for gene fusion detection with Kinex isosic data and PP fusion tool. So we can start with asking the question, what are fusion genes? So fusion genes are abnormal genes formed by the joining of two separate genes. They're often caused by chromosomal rearrangements and can drive cancer progression. So these fusion genes are found in various cancer types, including sarcomas, leukemias, and uh, carcinomas. And you can see in this slide, the different mechanisms of fusion gene from formation, such as chromosomal translocation, interstitial deletion, and chromosomal inversion. And then why we're interested in gene fusions. So one of the things people are really interested in is their potential to generate new antigens. So new antigens are unique proteins produced by cancer cells but are absent from healthy tissues. And these proteins are digested and presented on the cancer cell surface where they can be recognized by our T cells. So the discovery of new antigens is critical to develop effective cancer vaccines. So here are the examples from two recent publications. On the left is a paper from our collaborator, Olga Akuko, looking at isoform detection in HER2 breast cancer with bulk isosic. They found that of the more than 140,000 splicing isoforms that were detected, 67% of the isoforms were novel. And furthermore, these novel isoforms were enriched in oncogenes. There were 74 isoforms found in HER2 alone, one of, the one of the best studied genes in cancer. And in many of the novel isoforms were missing conserved function domains or had different predicted protein loca localization, which indicates that these isoforms are likely performing a different biological function. And on the right is a paper using single cell isoseq in ovarian cancer to detect both isoforms and the fusions. Here I'm showing one of the novel fusions they detected with IGF2 BP2 in red on the 5' prime end, fused to TSPA1 on the 3' prime end, because an added issue with single cell is that you're usually only reading the 3' prime end of the transcript. So this resulted in fusion reads getting incorrectly labeled as overexpression of TSPA1, since that's what's on the three prime end. However, long reads were able to correctly identify that the reads are actually coming from this novel fusion and the expression levels of TSPA1 are no longer elevated compared to normal cells. So the authors actually say in the paper that using short reads could lead to wrong biological conclusions, which really highlights the importance of characterizing, characterizing the complete transcriptome. So with the Kinex methodology, which dramatically increased the throughput by concatenating multiple transcripts for read, we can use isosic data to reliably detect the gene fusions. And our tool supports both bulk and a single cell data. And it can use, you can use clustered transcripts generated by isosic cluster tool or hi-fi reads themselves. And we now offer a complete workflow for gene fusion detection. So you start with ex extraction, then goes into library prep using isosic, the libraries are then sequenced and the data goes into our PB fusion workflow, which lets you call and visualize fusion transcripts in your sample. So here is the PB fusion workflow. It's very straightforward. You begin with isosic data, again, either clustered transcripts or hi-fi reads. So these are aligned using PBMM2 
and then pass it to PPFusion along with the gen code annotation file. So what happens internally is PPFusion annotates each transcript it sees, searching for breakpoints within the reads. Here, a breakpoint indicates that a read aligns to two different genes or strains. So PPFusion will then cluster these breakpoints to identify potential fusion events and outputs a tabular BDPE format containing support information that can be used for filtering false positive variants. And we evaluated the performance of PPFusion by simulating 100 fusion and 9,000 non-fusion reads based on GenCode transcript models. And we then ran them through with PPFusion and another fusion detection tool, Jaffle. We found that PPFusion shows higher sensitivity compared to Jaffle tool. And both tools share a similar false positive rate, where most of them are from mapping errors. So PPFusion is now available on GitHub and Bioconda, and we have detailed documentation on GitHub, and you can check it out later. So to run PPFusion, you will use the command PPFusion discover, and then you give it an aligned BAM file uh, and a reference GTF file. So the input BAM file can be either aligned ISO seq HiFi data that is produced by PBMM2 with the ISO seq preset and the sort flag, or it can be polished transcripts like the output of ISO seq cluster two. And you might also notice that there's a dot bin here. We have a tool that comes with PPFusion, the GFF cache tool that lets you take a GTF file and convert it to a binary representation. So you don't have to use it, but if you are rerunning PPFusion a lot, this makes it run a lot faster because it creates an index of the genes rather than having to read in the flat TXT file. And there were two settings that you may find useful. One is the threshold of gene read-through, because we're starting to notice in isosync data, uh, there's a lot of gene read-through. So basically, you get transcription of a gene, and then the neighboring gene, that's real biology, but it's not necessarily the types of fusions that people are classically looking for. So you can adjust the read-through threshold like how long between two neighboring genes that you will consider it to be read through rather than the fusion. So in this example, we require the two genes must be 100 kilobases apart. And the other is minimum coverage. You can get uh, the reads to support a breakpoint. So this is the bad P output shown here below. And you have a header that gives you all the descriptions of any of the fields you might want to filter or test out. So I'm going to walk you through an example. We've been collaborating with Professor Morrissey at the University of Calgary. So who specializes on sarcomas? So sarcomas are rare cancers often characterized by a poor prognosis, such as Ewing sarcoma. So there are also different types of sarcomas, and a lot of them are fusion-driven. So essentially, we just run PPFusion out of the box, and then we did a few filters for refinement. We removed ribosomal and immunoglobulin genes, because immunoglobulin genes like VDJ can produce genuine biological fusions. And these are typically not of primary interest. So we removed anything in VDJ, and then we also removed the mitochondrial genes. We then filtered for fusion events supported by at least five reads and separated by at least 100 kilobases. So uh, PPFusion was able to discover 23 known and 99 novel fusion gene events in 12 sarcoma samples. So on the right, we're showing a sarcose plot with all of the fusions detected in these sarcoma samples, again, giving a complete view of RNA dysregulation in these sarcoma samples. 
So this study has been uh, described in detail in our AACR poster back in last year, and you may use the link below to access the poster. So here's an example of what that output actually looks like. So the Fusion event is visualized by using this Python script, visualizefusion.py. So this is an accessory Python script with pbfusion. It will produce a genome browser plot when given an annotation, a bad PE file, and a mapped band. So back to this case, fusion occurs between TFE3 and ASP SCR1. So the top two panels contain the annotated transcripts for each gene with ASP SCR1 in orange and the TFE3 in blue. So the bottom panel shows the actual fusion transcripts detected and the sequencing. And importantly, this includes precise breakpoint identification, so which is a challenge for other methods. And this fusion gene is a known mutation for ASPS samples and was successfully detected by PP fusion. And then another exciting th thing is we collaborated with researchers at Fred Hodgson Cancer Center, and they're working on Ewing sarcoma samples, and they have developed a hybrid capture method to enrich for EWSR1 FL1 fusion event, the sole driver in Ewing sarcoma in single cell sequencing libraries. And then and they aim to identify which fusions occurs in which specific cell to support their research, we expanded PP Fusion's import capability to incorporate the cell barcode tags that are generated by our single cell workflow. So the figure to the left is a TSNA plot showing a breakdown of the different cell types that are in this data set. On the right, we have the same dimensionality reduction, but colored by whether or not that cell is expressing EWRS1, FLI1. So you can also see some non ewing cells are circled in magenta and they shouldn't have any EWSR1, FLI1 expression. We think that the false positive cells are most likely from misaligned cell barcodes. Okay, so this is all I have for today. Um, and I hope this will be helpful for your research or projects. Um, let me see. Okay. Thank you, Ting Ting. Um, I don't think we have any other questions in the chat. But um, I have a question for you, Ting Ting. Okay. We have some people doing metagenomics. Um, do we have? A, are you aware of any examples of people doing meta transcriptomics with Wi-Fi, SSIC? Meta meta genomics. Meta transcriptomics. Meta transcriptomics. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. I think I have seen some a couple of publications where people used uh, bacterial transcriptomes often don't have poly-A tails. And we use an oligo DT primer to make cDNA. I have seen some assays where you can add uh, um, adenines to the ends of your transcripts and then use that in an assay to produce full-length cDNA from bacterial genomes. Okay. I'm not sure that if they're uh -huh. Okay, that I'm not I'm not aware of. Yeah. Okay. Wilson's Wilson's just commented in the chat. So I think if we don't have any other questions, then um unless you have any other final comments, Ting Ting. We can end a little bit early and give some people uh time back. I'll just um, also remind everyone that this session was recorded and we do have um, a previous session from last week recorded as well. And so after this event, we'll send out an email communication with links to the videos. 
uh, of these of these sessions. And please, if you have any follow up questions, then um, if you can respond to that email or put um, uh, your questions in response to the survey, and then we will we will follow up after after that. So again, thank you, Ting Ting, for filling in for uh, Tsing Liang today. And um, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you also to Millennium Science for hosting this event through um, uh, through this Zoom uh, webinar. And um, one last comment as well, actually, is we had some expressions of interest for additional bioinformatics webinars, in particular 16S. Um, but if you have any other um, requests or asks of particular topics that you would like covered, then we will look to do a follow-up series of bioinformatics webinars follow, uh, covering any other topics of interest. So look out for that in your inbox. So thank you very much. And that concludes oh. today's session. Ting Ting, do you have thank any other yeah. comment? No, no, I just want to say thank you everyone for attending this. Yeah. If you have yeah. any requests, just uh, contact MS or James. Yeah. Excellent. And thanks for hosting, James. That was excellent. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Thank you for answering questions yeah. in the chat. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Goodbye.